Okay, so I guess we'll just get started and I'd like to thank, we'd like, both of us would like to thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my name is Jason Erickson. I'm an associate professor over in the College of Pharmacy. I'm Mimi Lee. I'm professor in College of Education in Instructional Technology, now Learning Design and Technology. Yes, <laughs> nice to meet you. And so we are part of what's called the OP the UH Open Educational Resources Committee. And um, we're here today to talk to you a little bit about the UH Alternative Textbook Incentive Program. This is a program that uh, the committee is, helped, is developing that is intended to deploy um, open educational resources to our students across the university. And I assume that uh, many of you are at least somewhat familiar with this. And um, for those of you who are not, we're going to give a, a short presentation. We didn't want to bore you with too many slides, but give you a short overview of what is this thing called OER, and then talk about how, what's coming, and how you can use it in your class, in your classroom environment. OK, so this is just a brief overview of the presentation. We're going to first talk about what are open educational resources, what's kind of a very, very brief history of OER, and importantly, why should we care about this? You know, what are the reasons to care about this? Not only from a student perspective, open educational resources are free, or can be very low cost in some cases, but they have very liberal licensing terms. But why should we care about something like that, not just from a student perspective, but also as faculty and staff? You know, what are the benefits to deploying this at the university? But we'll cover some of the basics in that, in that. And then one of the things we wanted to also cover is uh, faculty and staff often wonder about how can you use these resources? You know, what, what about copyright? This is something that's often kind of confusing. And so we wanted to, we could talk a long time about that, but basically we want to cover this briefly and just give you an idea of how are open educational resources protected how are your rights protected if you develop them, and what can you do with your work and others? Um, and this leads naturally into something that we're promoting as this committee. What is the UH Alternative Textbook Incentive Program? It's, of course, our committee's uh, goal and the goal of the university to get more of these resources into the UH environment. So we're going to tell you a little bit about that. And then basically approaches to find open textbooks or open resources. How can you do that? And what about the quality of these resources? People often think that free means not very good. We hope that will dissuade you from that today. And last but not least, how can we help you? So we'll cover ways to get in touch and what we can do to help you just moving this forward. Um, okay, and this is kind of a... Again, a, this is a short presentation. We came up with about 20 minutes worth of material. Maybe be a little bit longer, but we want to, if you have questions as we're going along, the idea of these slides is we assume that many of you know something about OER, and so this might spark some interest. And so feel free to interrupt and ask questions. You know, we'll do our best to answer those. So let's begin by just talking a little bit about what are open educational resources. So this is commonly defined, oh, it's also known as OER, so I'll use those interchangeably, but these are defined as teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain. So that's what we would typically think, something that doesn't have any copyright at all, right? You can just reuse it. Things like Project Gutenberg online, you can find books that are in the public domain, for instance. But there are other resources, and these are, these are resources that have been released under a copyright license that permits anyone to freely, re, to freely use and repurpose them. Now, most of the time, uh, this is most commonly known as a Creative Commons license. That's the most common form of license, and we'll talk about that today. There's lots of variations of uh, CC licenses. So going back in time a little bit, um, the history of open educational resources movement is about 10 years old give or take a little bit, and was conceived as a way to transform and democratize access to education, so ways to make it freer, cheaper, more accessible for everyone. And since the development, since the, that initial development of OER, 
uh, the resources and the momentum towards this has grown tremendously over the last few years, probably in, in large part due to the availability of these resources through the internet. It's very easy now for anybody to produce scholarly works and distribute them around the world so lots of people can enjoy them. And with the growth, with this growth, um, there have been several major OER repositories that have been established online. And so these offer very convenient access to high quality, professionally vetted or curated um, forms of open educational resources that, are, that can be readily adapted and used in the classroom in whatever form people want. Now, why is this coming to University of Houston? Well, uh, this is because we've had continuous growth in this area and increasing interest. Textbooks have been getting more expensive. They pose some challenges for students to adopt and use them in the classroom. This is a common complaint. Students always you know, have concerns about the economics, but textbooks have been steadily going up. And so this has been recognized in Texas and in other states as being an issue. And so the state government, we've had discussions, uh, there's been changes in the state government and discussions about implementing OER in, in universities. And then in various universities, we've become aware of this movement. There are all these resources becoming available. And um, there's an interest in getting this into the classroom. And then within the student body, this is another important stakeholder who's interested in OER. So this was actually an agenda on the Student Government Association last year. This was a, actually a platform. And so they were talking to the provosts and interacting with the library. And so it seems like a naturally good fit. So why should we care about OERs? And so this is the one, this is a typical slide that you see if you saw another presentation on this. We care about this, first of all, from the perspective of, of serving our students at this university. In national surveys where they've looked across the board at students, about 65% of students uh, during their academic careers will skip purchasing one or more textbooks because of the price. They can't afford it. And there's some quotes on the right here of different students. We have more, um, more mature students taking courses at community colleges who, have to, who can't afford the cost of these textbooks. Uh, and we have younger students who often look at textbooks and not buy them for one reason or the other. They say, oh, it's not needed. You know, faculty recommend buying this, but they just don't buy it because it's not needed. Or some of the text, or the textbooks are just too expensive, and they pass up on those. But this is one that I thought I should talk about. What are some faculty benefits of adopting open educational resources? Because as a faculty member myself, I really like the idea of open education resources, but it's, I, my first perception of that is always, wow, it's a lot of work. I'm going to have to bring this into my class. Why in the world would I want to do that? So I, I thought it was important to just talk a little bit about this. Rem re one of the things to remember is that you don't have to completely replace your textbooks in a course. You can bring this in as supplementary material with maybe the idea of testing it out and bringing it in and fully deploying it later, if you can. But there's a number of benefits, and so these are just some that I've gotten from, that were listed on this uh, website down at the bottom here. But basically, what do we see? Augmentation of class materials is an important one. I thought this was a pretty important benefit. So you can take publicly available open educational resource textbooks, for instance, and adapt them to your own needs without getting permission. The permission is there to do that. That's what it's there for. So you can tailor this to your exact needs, taking material out of it and deploying it in the classroom. OERs can be used to supplement textbooks and lectures where deficiencies are evident. So some tech students will complain that these textbooks may not, may not be particularly good. Sometimes they'll go to things like Wikipedia, right, which is an open, you can say it's an open educational resource. Educators don't typically like that because of lack of authorship but I know many students who use that as a resource. Scalability is another example. We can easily distribute these widely, just post them electronically on our site. We don't have to worry about copyright. Right? So we can distribute these at very low or no cost to our students. A third one is one that I thought was really important 
to emphasize. And as a faculty member working in the sciences, this is one I see frequently, and it's a good reason to have OER resources, for instance, pr to produce OER resources and provide them to others. So in this case, say that somebody creates an OER resource, and they post it on a university, through a university website. A wide audience can be aware of the faculty members' work this way, right? So it showcases their interests and expertise. You can attract potential students this way. It enhances donor recognition of the sites. Um, and you can enhance student and faculty recruitment efforts. Where is this in play? Or where, what are some examples? One prominent example is um, MIT, MIT's Open Courseware. They post both materials and they post their lectures online. And these are done under a Creative Commons license. And they've been doing this for a long time. And this attracts lots of students, international students. It bolsters their already good, excellent reputation in the field. We have other folks that do this. Khan Academy is another example. Some of you may know students who use that. And of course, academic journals will use, sometimes will have open resources that can be used under a Creative Com uh, Commons license. Just to finish up a few of these, and we'll move on. I don't want to spend too much more time on this. We can enhance regular course content. We can, again, distribute this quickly. Um, sometimes open educational resources are beneficial because you may develop course uh, material that strengthens ties with alumni. I put that towards the bottom, but sometimes people think about that. If you produce something, you can get increased donors to the university in recognition through this way. Another thing is open educational resources can be continuously improved, right? Publication of books takes a long time. Maybe there's something new. If you've authored a work or you remix an existing work, you can quickly change it and distribute it to your students. And last but not least, expanded access of learn to learning. This goes along with scalability and quick circulation. Okay, so that covers, probably not exhaustively, but some of the major benefits that accrue to faculty and staff who can use these resources. So what is OER? Or how can you use materials like textbooks or other things you see online? There are what we call the five R's. Okay, and these correspond to, first one is retain. So anytime you get OER resources, you can make, own, or control copies of the content that's provided to you under these licenses. You make unlimited copies if you, you can retain these um, as long as you want. Secondly is reuse. You can reuse the content in a variety of ways. You're not restricted by publisher requirements. So there's a lot you can do with OER any kind of OER license, uh, OER type material. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before I hand over this discussion is the Creative Commons license, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. You may not exactly know what it is. You may wonder, well, is that something legit? Like, is this a real copyright thing, or is this something that, you know, is, is a nice idea, but not really that useful? Let me talk about what it is first. So the Creative Commons license is, very, is a very powerful concept in terms of providing academic freedom. It lets you control how your content is distributed, and freely distributed to others, and you can uh, provide a variety of levels depending upon what you wish to do. So we have the, this is, um, we're going to go from the least free to the most free. And I'll give you an example of, say you write a scholarly book. You worked on this for a couple of years, and you say, I want it to be widely available to people, but I really do not like the idea that somebody's going to take my book and they're going to edit it and reuse it, but I want to give it out. I want to retain the authorship, the right to control um, any changes to it. You can do that. You can use what we call an attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. What that means is essentially this is a very restrictive license, but it says you can hand it out, your authorship information, everything doesn't change on it but it can be freely distributed and used worldwide. That might be good for classes. Yes, question. How does that actually work? So we have done this with some materials that we've created for recitations, and they're posted as the next one up, the attribution, non-commercial share. Share alike. How does that do anything? Like, what happens when somebody tries to download that? Well, when they download it, it should come with the license, right? That okay. license will be with the... Oh, so my colleague actually... Did this, mm -hmm. 
I, I've done it through iNaturalist, which is a you know, website for people who want to go out and observe stuff and you choose this. And then whatever photos you took come up like this. What I don't know for our document is how does anyone find out that we chose this? So my, you my, go to that website? Well, so Creative Commons can typically be packaged with the document, but if it's okay. hosted on the website, that will have a term of use. Okay. So it's no different yeah. than going to any publisher website. Right. And these are actually legally enforceable. So there have right. been instances where people have ripped off stuff, for lack of a better term, they use this, and they did not follow the Creative Commons licenses, and that's legally enforceable. So you can enforce your rights as an author. Now, nobody really wants to do that, but can do that. It depends on the how broad your license is, right? Mm -hmm. But the purpose of Creative Commons is always to encourage attribution. So it's not just using the material, it's not just public domain, but you want to be recognized for your works as scholars, right? not just to distribute it freely. And so this is kind of the currency of academics, right? We want our names attached to work. So this is a value of having this license. Um, but just going up very quickly, so we have the attribution non-commercial share alike to iNaturalist or other places, what this lets you do is remix the existing work. Again, you have to maintain attribution, so it has to be credited with the original author and where it came from. And it also is given under identical licensing terms. This pro prohibits commercial reuse, so somebody couldn't take your work and put it onto a for-profit website or put it into a book and try to sell it. That would be a violation of this copyright. And as we go up, these become progressively less restrictive, and I'll just leave this here for right now, but um, we get up to something like attribution share alike. And so if you've ever edited articles on Wikipedia, I've done that, I've contributed photos and done other things on that website, because I like doing that. Um, that's kind of a Wikipedia, Wikipedia uses an attribution share alike, so it tracks authorships and um, you can remix, copy, reuse the work. And then the last and least restrictive license is attribution, and that's just you can use it for any purpose as long as you credit the original author. So that can be commercial or non-commercial use. Okay. So just to give you an idea of how widely this is used, this was the last one I could find, and it's uh, off of Wikipedia actually. But there was somebody who, who you know, looked at the number of million, how many works are out there. Is this a fringe thing? And the answer is no. It's actually used in a huge number of things. Lots of governments post works under Creative Commons licenses. And so as of 2014, it was over 800 million, probably much higher now. I didn't, just wasn't able to get figures on that. OK, and I'll pass it over to you. So when we were um, designing our presentation today, we were thinking, like, so there would be some of you who are interested in actually um, using an open textbook in class, and some of you are in a position to convince faculty to use them. So it was, um, we had thought about how to organize our presentation. So we decided that with some um, information that Jason has provided, we would go right into uh, the alternative textbook incentive program that we, you know, you are interested. And after that, um, get some more um, feedback from you or questions that are very specific to you and open up for discussion. Um, so this is just a little gist of the um, incentive program. So as Jason has mentioned, the impetus for our UH to try something like this came um, straight from our Student Government Association. Um, last year it was their big platform. This year, who's a new, now we have a new um, president, and he also has the textbook affordability as one of the issues that he ran and uh, won with. So it continues to be, the, the affordability of textbook continues to be uh, one of the main issues and concerns for our students. So the reason we've talked about um, open textbooks so far and open resources, and you might um, notice that now the term is alternative. So where does open meet or overlap with alternative? So there are many um, institutions, higher ed um, libraries and schools that have implemented um, some kind of open textbooks. And some of them use the word open textbooks. 
and some of them use the term alternative to focus, I guess, emphasize the fact that, um, you know, alternative focuses more on the control that uh, each instructor has in, in ways that they can um, use the existing open textbook and adapt to their specific context. So that I think is very powerful for some of our faculty who want to have more contextualized um, you know, information provided to our students. So we've decided to use the term UH Alternative Textbook um, Incentive Program. So award for UH faculty to implement an open and or alternative textbook in their courses. Um, awarded between 500 and 2500, depending on if you're doing just adopting or adapting or actually writing a, a open textbook. So adoption, by adoption we mean that you use the existing open textbook and decide to use it in your class. That is our definition, understanding of adoption. Adaption is you take something that is out there as an open resource, adapt to your needs, there's some modification that you are doing, and then still, you know, you can um, refer to the original one, but there's some adaptation, adaption in, on your part for your specific needs. <laughs> writing a textbook is you are writing an open textbook, you are the author of it. So we thought that adoption, adaption, and writing will each one requires different kinds of time and effort. Therefore, the awards, uh, the amount of awards vary accordingly. Okay, um, awards are granted on the basis of projected cost savings for students, course frequency, and feasibility of successful implementation. And the application deadline is April 15, 2018. So if we go into if you want to minimize and just go to Chrome, okay. it's up. Or maybe not. Okay, it's, I guess it's pulling up. Okay. Okay, so you go to this this um, website um, under Open Resource Educational Resources. You will find incentive program. And by the way, we um, specifically designed our um, presentation today that our contents will align with that what's already out here, right? Um, so. The incentive program has eligibility. Um, that it ha you have to be an instructor of record for the fall of 2018 or spring 2019. And awards will be granted on the basis of these. Projects that are not eligible for funding are commercial e-text versions of the existing print textbook, or textbook rentals, or existing textbooks alternatives already in use um, by faculty. The proposal must be a new project. Right? So, uh, are you expecting the textbook to be replaced during the semester as you list the uh, summer 2018, fall 2018, and spring 2019? Or yes. to use these semesters to develop material for subsequent years? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. How we envision is those um, new textbook to be implemented in fall, fall 2018 or fall 2018? Um, I mean, spring 2019, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's our. So, so you, you're not looking for development of a complete textbook, I presume, because a complete textbook takes a period right, 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 right. to be developed. It's some sensible material that students can use in lieu of a textbook. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know. I mean, so a, a step above simple lecture notes. Right. Not complete, but yet presentable, but makes sense. So, yes. Something like that will be somewhere along the line of adaption category, right? If you are making some modification of the existing one. Um, but if you, you know, um, writing will definitely take much more time. So especially first um, round like this, um, we expect more people um, trying adoption or adaption. Um, except that well, there was, there's a um, there, person there are some, nursing. There right? are several people who have been, who've already begun writing textbooks and might find this a, a opportunity to finish that textbook over the summer for implementation in the fall or spring. Um, and creation is definitely uh, something that we have at least three applicants so far who, that, who are working on and are partially through tech, writing their own textbooks so far. And I think in case was 
made also that it may not be a text that they're looking for, but keep it adaptable and modular and maybe on their web so that uh, it can be adapted and adapted to as many people as possible and all that, right? Mm -hmm. So some, depending on your discipline and what kind of um, textbooks, quote-unquote textbooks, are used in your field, um, I'm, I'm assuming there will be a, a, a you know, wide range of what it looks like. But the, the key principle um, ideas behind this is it has to replace something in a way that, because when the students came to us as, an, you know, this as a big platform, they wanted to see you know, the dollars saved, right? Mm -hmm. So especially for this incentive program, um, it's, we would like to see as an institution how your new effort or new project saves this amount of um, dollars for the students, right? Yeah, I, I have a question. I was originally thinking of an existing textbook mm -hmm. that Open had found in this website mm -hmm. that, could, that could substitute for the textbook that we use in an undergrad course mm -hmm. in our department. Mm -hmm. Of course, what I would be missing, and, and, and the other people, would, and this is a grant that teaches like 125 students in two semesters. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's large enough. Mm -hmm. That's large enough. Mm -hmm. The required grant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so this this textbook seems to be very similar. It's introduction to research mm -hmm. to psychology. But of course, what we would be missing is all the supplemental material. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the commercial textbook bring like uh, uh, quizzes that you can bring. Right. So, so that money could be used to hire like a graduate student in the summer. I'm just I'm asking for mm -hmm. to kind of work with me, for example, to recreate that supplemental material or adapt some of the supplemental material that I have mm -hmm. to the, the, the this open source textbook that is already available. I think you want to be in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Is that what that money could be for? Um, in the proposal, you you absolutely could use that money. Um, there, the incentive money will be delivered, um, half of it will be delivered upon uh, receiving the award and the other half delivered at the end of the semester. So it is not tied, there are no specifications on how you need to use it. You could use it to hire a graduate student. But then we're not the one to the graduate student. If you have other funds at your disposal um, until okay. the second half came through, I see. So it's, it is truly an incentive, um, not. Um, so this is the money for the faculty members to use for whatever you want. Yes. Oh, I thought the money needed to be justified. Okay, so then that changes my question. And then, for this Thank sort you. of project, what would be a reasonable expectation of, of a work? You know, it's a book that exists. Mm -hmm. Founded there, I've been looking at it since we did the deal for the Hamburg notebook. And it would be a matter of doing all the supplemental materials that I use if I don't continue using the commercial book that I've been using. So, so that would be what, like 500 dollars? Yeah, yeah. So, I you know. I'd like to know what a ballpark is because then I have to translate this. But I really, I don't have the time to sit and recreate all that. Mm -hmm. I can't do that at this point. I have to give up many other things. So if I could be able to hire a doctoral student to help me do that, a guidance for it, it would be worth it. And that would be an example of adaptation. That's a yes. adaptation mm -hmm. of the right. 16 mm -hmm. textbook out there. Well, if you would, if you're simply adopting the textbook and then creating the supplementary materials, mm -hmm. um, is an example of adoption plus creation of supplementary right, materials. And if you're licensing right. those as, right. as open, you have actually created the materials. Right. Well, so it's a combination of those two. Right. Um, and if, if you look at the, uh, maybe can you scroll up just a little? So the awards will be granted on the basis of projected cost savings and overall impact. So if this is a course that has high enrollment, that's taught regularly, that's replacing, uh, expensive textbooks, all of that will factor into the amount of the award, but I, we can't tell you right now right, how much right, that would be. Right, It'll right. be somewhere between 500 and 2,500. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, if you're at a, so, so you don't really have to justify what I would be using the money for. Yeah. 
As long as it goes into you trying out this as a right, so so right. you have you have to implement right. No, I understand. But, but if yeah. somebody is going to have to read those applications and make decisions, you know, so mm -hmm. I don't understand what are the criteria. So the criteria really is how much money you are going to be saving your students. The impact, I mean, it's a required course in my under five students a year, something like that. Okay. Right. All right. So then my last question. If, if this is when would it be held? I believe we said early May. May. In May. Because my in May. In yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Early, early May. May. Early so, May. yeah. Okay. All right. So, by the way, those of you who don't know, this is Carrie Quillman, who is, she is a, a very critical member of our um, committee. Um, so, and I think with, with this, even with this group, there are just so many ways that this could be, you know, imagined and um, designed. So um, we were going to wait until later, but, you know, um, there's a team of us who are librarians, faculty like me and Jason, and we also um, have recently hired an OER um, specialist librarian. Um, she will be starting, you know, right away. So if you have any specific questions about the eligibility and how you are imagining it, um, you know, send, there's going to be a contact information at the end of the presentation. You can contact us and we can kind of brainstorm yeah, some with I you how it's, if it's eligible. Yes. One more question. Like some of those supplemental materials are going to be like multiple choice questions or exams. Do we have to put those out there too? No, mm -hmm. not necessarily. No. Yeah. No. The other, the other would be labs to do in class. That's different. That's okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, there, there is absolutely nothing that says that you have to develop supplemental materials and make them available. You could yeah. develop them through Blackboard, through Blackboard quizzes every week. And you can work with your instructional mm -hmm. designers on how best to embed them into the curriculum. Um, you can hire a graduate student or not um, for departments that uh, that teach high enrollment core classes or required classes and, and make those decisions by committee. Perhaps that's something that um, a committee of faculty could contribute to and definitely keep that in-house uh, so that the answers, so you don't have to recreate the wheel every semester. Um, but it, it just depends on what your goal is. And we're happy to meet with you mm -hmm. and talk through how we can support your project. And unfortunately, for those high enrollment courses, where the supplementary materials are essential, they don't exist in all of the open textbooks. Okay. Places like OpenStax coming out of Rice, they're starting to build supplementary materials and market those at a low cost additional fee of, well, only fee, of approximately $10. Uh, but most of the open textbook uh, repositories haven't done that yet. Yes. So each one of you might find certain things um, very helpful and maybe it's not for even the, the courses that you are teaching that might not be one for one group and versus another. But as, as you know, uh, as a member of the committee, uh, we want to stress that open resources is definitely worth exploring the possibility of using it for um, the reasons uh, that how we have explained and there are just many different ways of using it so um, I would like you know this I hope this presentation and incentive program at least gets you incentivized to um, try it so there are a lot of open textbook websites as we have talked about a little bit open textbook library OER Commons um, open textbook store I don't want to spend too much time on it so I'm gonna just open up one just to get you a sense of what it is. OpenStax College, this is coming from Rice, and the founder of this has done a lot of open resources work. Um, Richard Berenick from Rice and I think uh, Engineering. So he has been doing this uh, a long time. So they, they have these, like, so if you go to pre-algebra and you have um, ways to view this, right? And details and resources. And these are peer reviewed. Um, so there have, they have the review systems where you can read their reviews and um, that could hopefully, um, you know, at least um, 
reduce some of your concerns about the quality of it. So I hope you explore these websites where um, there are different kinds of. Can you share this with us? Yes, so I'm going to, you know, this uh, presentation will be available. And these um, open textbook and um, information is available on that um, site that I just showed you about um, the um, incentive program. So if you oh, go to the okay. open recipe, yeah, it's, we, we actually have two more bullets that are on there. So yes, it will be available to you. You're saying this list is already available. Yeah, yeah. On our, yeah. If you go to incentive program, there are like, you know, some in the menus, couple menus about OER and, and has the findings, uh, textbooks. So quality of OER resources and educational impact of open textbooks. So, um, you know, especially when you have to convince or you know, encourage and or get a buy-in from your faculty, if you are instructional designer of your you know, college and um, librarian, a lot of faculty, faculty, me being faculty myself, will talk about, okay, this is open, you know, this is a different way of understanding the um, intellectual property. So coming from a very traditional peer-reviewed um, journal article format of education, it's very easy for me to um, understand the concerns and suspicion almost about the quality of this um, OER resources. So um, many OER are developed through rigorous peer review and production processes that mirror traditional materials. Um, being open does enable educators to use resource more eff effectively, which can lead to better outcomes, right? For example, OER can be updated, tailored, and improved locally to fit uh, the needs of students. And in education, you know, I'm, I'm involved in this um, more as a, uh, um, you know, OER researcher, my research, one of my research strengths is about MOOCs and open education. So I am very aware and uh, I can easily make available to you some of the um, scholarly um, articles about OER that come from, uh, you know, um, high tier journals and um, about scholarly uh, actual empirical data talking about the quality of um, OER and the benefits of it. So if you have um, colleagues or faculty who want to, you know, get a sense of what research is out there, um, kind of supporting that, you know, quality of OER is um, at least um, equivalent to traditional materials, I'll be more than happy to provide them. Um, studies at both the K-12 and high education level show that students who use OER do as well and often, often better than their peers using traditional resources. So other than this like one-on-one -on -one comparison, there are a lot of other benefits that OER um, bring because if depending on how you use OER in your classroom, you can actually um, involve your students to be part of that adoption or adaption kind of construction of that, right? So if, let's say, if you are doing a, you know, um, class in, I don't know, some business model that is very specific to Houston or certain parts of Houston, um, the traditional um, textbook might not cover it yet or if you can tailor make it specific to your students per se, where OER has that kind of benefits and gives more power or sense of control to the students who want to um, be you know, responsible for their own learning. So there are these kinds of like learning outcomes that, that we education um, researchers are very excited, so uh, we'll be more than happy to share it. Okay. So that's pretty much it for the presentation that Jason and I um, prepared. And I'm going to take the question. And also, I'm going to open it up, um, the, open up the floor for any specific questions so we can respond. Yes. How many awards will you have for this round? And uh, is there, if they receive, so the state also has a grant program. Uh, for OER, and if it won, can you get the other? 
That's a good question. We do not have anything in our incentive program that prohibits you from receiving the state incentive program. I don't know about that. But we can look into that and uh, let y'all know. Have you a number of awards you'll have? Uh, no. We have a finite amount of money, um, but we, honestly, this is the first round of this incentive program, uh, and we have a certain amount of money. It's about twenty thousand uh, dollars. We are going to see how many applications we get, how many we can fund, and at what levels. Yeah. So if we have a lot of people just adopting, then you know the number of recipients can grow. Well, and and so the criteria really are focused on the projected cost savings for students, mm -hmm. the frequency of the courses taught, um, successful implementation plan. Um, and, and whether people adopt or adapt or create is um, will factor in, but it's not the driving factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, at this point, we have like so. This seems like not a person, but behind this, you know, <laughs> email, there are five of us, right? The only reason that we have this is because we want to streamline all the questions in a way that there's one you know, repository where we can all go in. So this OER at uh.edu is um, Carrie Quilliman, Nora, you know, they've come to, we'll read it, so the whole committee. Um, so, and you know, if you have any questions or if you um, need those articles, um, I'll be more than happy to provide. So yeah, I can give, share my information um, later. So, Velvet and Nuha. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Can we? Can, can you send us this PowerPoint? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, email to us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um. So the materials that are being created, are they? Are they going to? Are they? I'm trying to ask like a clarification or making sure I understand right. There will be the the intellectual property of U of H. So if I go to some other university, that resource I develop really stays with U of H under the U of H website. I can't take it with me since it's, and say, hey, this other university, you know, yeah. I created this, let's start implementing this in our university. I mean, I think to answer that question, one of the things is that often these will be licensed under Creative Commons license, right? right? So right. Creative Commons license says, you depending can. upon, yeah, you can, yeah. and it's not, it's actually released, and you, you're, you are the creator, and you get attribution. Um, but that's one of the very nice things about this, is that you can really make a broad or restrictive license. This content is to let other people use it. So, right, exactly. yeah, so you can widely deploy it among, in different universities, people can take it with them. And do things with it. And we have a we have there are multiple options for where we can host content that's created. Uh, we can host it in our University of Houston inter, uh, institutional repository, mm -hmm. but we also have faculty who are pursuing other hosting options. Mm -hmm. So, do you intend to create like exactly the same like uh, rights, let's say, or something like OER for? for the faculty, encourage the faculty to write their own textbooks? Or do you have this um, for a long-term uh, goal? So for the incentive program, we are pursuing funding for multiple rounds of an incentive program, not just this one. Mm. Um, in terms of creating an open textbook repository, we are not currently pursuing that. We can host textbooks in our institutional repository. Uh, we can that we are a member of the open textbook library. And so the goal is that while we may host a textbook created by UH faculty in our institutional repository, it gets added into the open textbook library. Yeah. So that it's more findable. All of the open stacks textbooks are into the open textbook networks open oh, textbook right. library um, and it may be a possibility for that textbook to be hosted in not just open textbook library but also BC Commons or some of the other repositories as well. 
I think the goal of the committee, though, is sustainability, right? We don't want to just do this one. The <clears throat> goal is to find some people who really are committed or interested in doing this and, and want to try it out, make it part of their class. And hopefully, what we hope is over the long term that people will see the benefits of this. Yeah. There's work involved in this, and that's the, always the hard part to get people get this rolling. But there are lots of universities that have adopted this. Um, I don't know if I mentioned Houston Community College is one group that's adopted this, so right in our backyard. And then uh, I think it's British Columbia. Mm -hmm. They have an enormous, that was interesting. I was looking around, and that's a university that's, this has been very successful. It's something like 40 or 60 classes, lots and lots of adoption. They save the students a lot of money, and it's, so it's interesting. And then I uh, actually teach online at a, another university, and they're going to almost all open textbooks. So that's a, it's a very interesting trend to see this coming um, in education. But we definitely want to make it a long-term class. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, we really appreciate it because the students are complaining about the price, especially in computer science. Yeah. Uh, every year it's, they change a new book and new technology and, new, and mm -hmm. this is very, very important for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, Thank uh, you. Yeah, just a one. I'm sorry, one one small comment on that is uh, one of my uh, collaborators uh, actually doing this open textbook for a computer science course, and I had encouraged him to. He was doing it just because he wanted to tailor this textbook to his class. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. Anyway, I, I've seen it already, and it looks pretty pretty good. But I said, well, you should apply, <laughs> you know, because. Just yeah. in that, those textbooks are something like two hundred dollars, and so uh, yeah. a small, even a small number of students yeah, can end up saving a lot of money for these students. So I thought that's great, especially if other people want to do that. Thank you. Lee? So um, I know I'm a librarian, so I'm working with these ladies, and um, I know that SGA completed a survey about textbooks. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things that I found out was that. 37% of the respondents to the survey are not buying the required textbook at all. Um, so, you know, maybe the group can make some of that survey data available mm -hmm. um, on the OER site so yeah. people can take a look at that. Um, because, you know, your students from day one are at a disadvantage because they're not buying the textbook um, and they are just struggling to catch up after that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, good point. Okay. Do you guys have kind of a general rule of thumb of what kind of savings we minimum we should think about per student? So, you know, depending on how much cost of materials or books or whatnot, you know, what is our goal to say we're gonna save our students fifty percent, you know, savings. So what's a do you have a general rule of thumb of the of a number we should think about to say kind of see what needs to get adjusted to make these savings for students? All of it. Well, yeah, yeah, the, the goal is 100%, right? You want yeah. to complete, but, but for the program, for the reward. We don't, have, we don't have a specific dollar sign number in mind. Uh, what we are trying to do is we're trying to get participation up. Uh, one of the challenges with this incentive program, or with the program in general, is that we don't actually know how many faculty are yeah. using open textbooks and OERs on this campus. Mm -hmm. And one of our goals is to start identifying that information. Um, happily, the Texas Senate passed Le uh, Bill 810, and that actually requires us, requires faculty, requires university, to um, report when they're using OERs in the classroom, and we're doing that through the registrar's office. And that will be searchable by students as they're scheduling their classes. We're uh, in the process of getting more information about that on our website. I know the registrar's office has information about that, that they're pushing out through their channels. Uh, Amy Ramirez is here and can answer any questions you might have about that uh, later. Um, but our, our big goal is to get participation. Can we get as many faculty teaching with OERs as possible? Right now that starts with identifying who's using them, answering questions, starting to create a sea change or a culture shift around open education. Okay. 
So even if it saves students ten dollars, that's absolutely. Also, what I wanted to point out is, you know, you have you made a comparison with Rice, and you know, um, when you look at like in the University of Kansas or Kansas State system, where they are very active in using open textbook. Um, it's more of a dissemination that the institutions seem to be very focused on. RICE is very unique um, in the history of open education because um, it's like it's it has the open stacks had a previous name and it is, has has been there more than you know ten years of single-handedly by one you know faculty member and he ended up getting big grants and. You know, he's, he's done you know TED yeah, talk or things like yeah. that. So it was less about you know the institution getting on board from the beginning, but it was done through a, a faculty first, through other sources of um, financial support, and it's housed in um, you know Rice, and now it has a lot of um, you know it's because of the history of that person's work. So um, we are you know. Uh, Rice OpenStax has that kind of a very unique history, even within um, open education resources. And but I think you know we are you know different. We started out differently, and just like every other institutions, starting with getting a buy-in from uh, the faculty. And mm -hmm. as a public institution, we have even more responsibility to address that issue. So I think also if you have a survey to give it to us, mm -hmm. let's say. Uh, so we will see what we will what the student might expect. For yeah. example, I have I have uh, two kind of uh, PowerPoints. One PowerPoint is very fast, like yeah. based on graphics only. Mm -hmm. Second PowerPoint is more detailed, mm -hmm. and they have the open textbook, mm -hmm. and then they have the commercial textbook. Mm -hmm. So if you have, I'm just wondering if you have any survey like this. I would like also to see it so I can direct the student from the beginning of the form or on what to focus. So mm -hmm. I would tell them, let's say, so I will divide them into groups. Let's say one group will only study the OER, another group will study only the commercial textbook, mm -hmm. another one will rely on Google mm -hmm. or, you know, all the YouTube. And if ever, if ever you, you have something you want to or run it by our classes mm -hmm. for those who adopt the OER mm -hmm. just uh, put me in the loop so I can see what kind of questions to expect. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, there are a lot of different ideas and different ways I think we can, after this incentive program, have buy-ins, right? Mm -hmm. um, the co committee talked about like how to if there is any way that in the future we can add this, you know, how was the was was the textbook in your class affordable or was the you know instructor caring about that or something like that in the course evaluation yeah. that will make a huge difference in people thinking about this at least or you know writing a textbook, um, OER textbook could be used as a, a, a scar you know line in the scholarship. So there are many different ways that we can yeah. uh, impact continuous um, dissemination of this idea. So we are hopeful. So um, any other questions? Well, I, I have one more. Um, okay. So let's say we create a supplement of um, saving money somehow <laughs> to correct <laughs> the course. Um, I'm guessing we're going to have to get in touch with if, if at any point we talk about someone's theory mm -hmm. in this OER, right? Uh, we're going to probably have to get their permission, right, to say, hey, I'm going to be talking about someone's theory, or whatever, and we're going to have to get that permission before we can make this into an OER. Like, I have a feeling that there's going to be some copyright situations where unless you're completely writing something from scratch, it's your own theory, your own work, that there's going to be some complications with getting the okay to say, hey, I'm making an a o OER uh, item to supplement some of this material from here and here and there, right? So if, if you're, sorry, no, 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 no. If, if you're adapting or creating, you 
of course need to follow best practices for generating any academic material, which would require citation of any source material used. And if you are using images or data or anything like that, you have to abide by licensing and copyright agreements. So sometimes that will mean seeking permission in order to use something or incorporate it into the generation of your textbook. Um, we are happy to help with that at the library if you contact the OER at uh.edu address. We have a copyright team who can help with those questions. They already address a lot of those questions for material that we published in traditional um, journals and textbooks, and we're happy to yeah. continue okay. answering yeah, those questions yeah, for open know, material. You, you do it in class, which is a mm -hmm. restrictive environment. Yes, you can't um, just so grab something and throw the source link at the bottom like we did today and right. just be and good. distribute yeah. it to an online audience, which is worldwide, yeah. versus a closed classroom of 10 people yeah. that the license says you can use it in your classroom, but we didn't say you can use it yeah. and repost for a worldwide audience. Yeah, so and this is one of the challenges. We do have to yeah. find materials images, data, et cetera, that has been licensed with Creative Commons right. for reuse. Right. I'll, try to, I'll try to do my homework a little bit more on that particular question because that, you know, is uh, similar to what people do in MOOCs, right? When they, right. they have classes that they teach that, you know, anybody is accessible, there mm -hmm. has to be some way of being able to do that, so, right. yeah. Okay. I'll just add the in the libraries, we're also looking into what types of services we're going to be able to offer, or offer in terms of authorship and production. Um, and so we're just starting to do some of that legwork leg yeah. now. Um, and like at what scale, and at what level of detail, and so on and so forth. But, but. Any other questions? OK, well, well thank you. And thank you for coming, and uh, if you have any further questions and points of discussion, let us know.